Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Addressing Ageism Part 2, Ageism in Healthcare, presented by Home Instead and hosted by the American Society on Aging. We will begin shortly, but before we do, uh, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, I would like to direct you to the left side of your screen where you receive five tabs labeled Speaker Bio, Important Information on Group Viewing, CE Application Here, FAQ slash Troubleshoot, and Event Resources. The slides for today's presentation are available for download under the tab labeled Event Resources. You will find information on how to obtain CE credits for this event under the CE Application Here tab including links to the application and to the step-by-step -step CE guidance webpage. Please review before submitting an application. Also, please be aware that your time is logged and you must view the entire hour-long webinar to be eligible for CE credit and access the application. You will be able to access the CE application a minimum of two hours after viewing the live event. Uh, although it may take up to 24 hours, so we appreciate your patience. If you are not logged into the webinar directly using the email address you registered with, then you will not be eligible for CE credit as we have no way of tracking your online attendance. If you registered before the live webinar, you will also receive a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will direct you on how to claim CEs and include links to today's slides and recording. You have 60 days from the live event date to complete a continuing education application. If you have any questions during today's presentation regarding the webinar, you can send those to us at any time using the Ask a Question box, and we will do our best to get to those questions in the last few minutes of today's programming. And now, I would like to welcome our presenters. April Abara, MGS, is a dynamic leader with more than 25 years of experience in healthcare and aging. She is the Strategic Accounts Manager at Home Instead Senior Care and supports the organization's mission through collaborating and creating partnerships that develop impactful relationships for the Home Instead Network. Ibarra is a Certified Aging in Place Specialist, a Geriatric Care Manager, and a passionate champion for older adults and those who care for them. And Amanda Williams, MSN RN, who has focused her career on value-based care and population health strategies to transform health care. She designs processes that put the patient and client at the forefront of their care journey while focusing on autonomy, flexibility, wellness, and prevention. This passion led her to Home Instead, where she is part of the healthcare transformation team at the Global Health Headquarters working to implement strategies that make home care a valuable and strategic partner in the healthcare continuum. Amanda serves on the board of directors for Harlan Family Services, an organization that strengthens the community through advocacy and counseling. We are so excited to have you both here with us today. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. We are thrilled. Amanda, how are you doing today? Are you ready for this subject? I am April. Um, I had to get off mute first to be able to answer that question, but I am here and I am ready for this conversation. Looking forward to Excellent. it. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, well, I know that you, you have a lot of expertise in healthcare. And so I want to welcome everyone. I'm going to kick things off today. And I'm just thrilled to see that this topic has resonated with everyone and that you're here to learn more about helping to influence and shape how our society looks at aging. Personally, I think it starts with us as individuals to pave the way, uh, and, and this will help force society to come along because, quite frankly, aging adults are going to dominate the population. We've heard this for years. It's coming. It's coming. It's here. And who better to influence the face of aging than this group and everyone on this call? I have two perspectives on this topic as an aging woman and also as a gerontologist. As a gerontologist, my philosophy is to promote autonomy and encourage aging adults to live their fullest life uh, and not let age be a barrier to fulfilling their dreams. And personally, I think that the aging years are the best years. As an aging woman, I know firsthand that aging has impacted my body, and I don't think that's ages to say so. It is a personal truth. 
I believe we have to be realistic and acknowledge that there are good and bad things about aging, but uh, that's no different than any other decade. The truth is that our bodies may change as we grow older, but that doesn't mean we are not capable of living a full life. It might require some adjustments in how we perceive ourselves. I'm 59 uh, and I have severe arthritis now, and that really has uh, impacted my mobility. And I've had to accept that uh, some of the activities I used to be able to do, I still can, but I have to modify some things. Um, I love having an active lifestyle, but I have to rest a little bit more, wear good shoes, uh, and occasionally I take a little ibuprofen. So uh, not the end of the world, but we do change as we age. I hope you had the opportunity to listen to our uh, first webinar last month in this series. Uh, Lakeland and Molly focused on society's view on aging. If you didn't catch that, you can go back on demand uh, to uh, ASA's webinar list and, and listen to that. But they address the history of ageism. And unfortunately, today we are still living with old ideas, pardon the pun, uh, about what aging looks like. And slowly but surely, we are demonstrating by example what aging can be. And even still, there's disagreement on what aging should look like. Uh, Martha Stewart, you may have seen her um, on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 81 years old. Um, some cheered her on. Others criticized her for trying to appear too young. I was one that cheered her on, and I believe that aging is a unique experience. And we should let everyone define their own views on aging successfully. Let's face it, there's nothing more unique than individuals. Today, we are going to discuss how ageism appears in healthcare. And this too can be controversial, but it is a very important topic. So let's dig in, let's take a look at the objectives. We have four objectives today. We want to realize the prevalence of ageism in today's healthcare. We want to examine the implications. That's really what's important here. What are the implications of ageism in healthcare? We want to recognize and talk about opportunities and resources to help aging adults navigate healthcare to meet their own personal objectives as they age. And then I think it's also important that we examine the art of dying well and how to approach end of life on your own terms as you go. So prevalence of ageism, I'm just going to talk very briefly about some of the things that we addressed last time. 93.4% um, of U.S. adults aged 50 to 80 experience one or more forms of ageism. I'm sure that's not surprising. Uh, this JAMA study basically reports and kind of categorized as that into ageist messages, interpersonal reactions, and also internalized ageism, which I think is the most um Detrimental, really, how we perceive ourselves as we get older, if we think we're too old to do something or uh, we're too old to wear our hair long or wear a certain outfit, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Um, but also those ageist messages that come across in media and uh, movies um, are impactful as well as our interpersonal uh, interactions. And I'm wondering what you think about this. Do you think that uh, this will shift more as we age? I'm a baby boomer. I'm 59, as I said. Uh, I think it's changing. Uh, when you think about today's aging population, they grew up much differently. Their grandparents uh, perceived aging differently. So I think we have a good opportunity to really look a lot different uh, this, in ageism. Types of ageism. Uh, there's four listed here, and let's face it, they're all negative impact um, on aging adults and, and our society. Stereotypes, that we clump everybody. You know, when they start saying, oh, uh, you know, we studied uh, people who are in their 50s and 60s about how they felt about, you know, whatever the topic is. And you have to think somebody who's 50 to 60 is going to be a lot different than somebody who's 80 to 90. So we just can't clump it all together. We cannot stereotype. Older adults are not good with technology. Well, we didn't grow up with a tablet like today's younger population, but most of us can learn um, and most of us want to learn, right? Um, and, you know, older adults are crabby. Well, 
I believe in the continuity theory um, that people age just as they are, right? They're, if they were crabby in their 20s and 30s, they're probably going to be a crabby older adult. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we can't just put all these people together. Prejudice is also uh, very detrimental. Um, can you think of some prejudiced uh, statements you've heard or experienced related to aging? Um, you know, you think about, um, you know, oh, these people move too slow or, um, oh, they shouldn't be working because they, they don't know how to do things. It's, you know, those kind of things are very impactful. Um, and we really should not clump everyone into that category. We're all unique aging adults. Discrimination is a huge impact, especially in the workforce. And there's been a lot of great work on this. And heaven knows right now we need workers. So I think it's interesting um, that sometimes it is harder for an older worker to get hired. Uh, so we need to change that. And I think we're going to do that. Um, and then there's also the positive or benevolent ageism. And that's viewing older people as warm but incompetent. And, you know, I'm a honey, sweetie, darling kind of girl, whether it's an old person or a young person. I, I have to be careful about that. And I, I, I love aging adults so much that I'm, I think they're all adorable and fantastic. But that also could be um, disrespectful, could be ageist. So I think we have to be careful with how we look at that. We know that ageism in the media is, um, is always interesting. Uh, only 15% of images in the media are traditionally of older adults. Uh, that's changing. Remember, We're, this is the, the decade of change. AARP teamed up with Getty Images to create positive images in aging. We're going to take a look at some of those. But as you look at this, what do you think? Um, I love the what channel is net, the Netflix? Um, you know, okay, they don't understand. Netflix is a streaming. It's a little complicated. This has all happened very fast. But once again, that doesn't mean we can't learn. So uh, media plays a heavy, heavy role. But some of you may have seen some of the same movies I have, uh, which I've loved. 80 for Brady, uh, Book Club, um, you know, Frank and Gracie. There's just some great programs, I believe, in, in the media now that are really portraying aging adults in, in, a, in the way that they are, right? Funny or, um, you know, um, you know, whatever they, whatever it is, they're just letting people be themselves, talk about sex, talk about different things, even though they're older. Um, you take a look at this slide, and of course, you know, it's all doom and gloom, right? Um, you're looking at uh, somebody who has mobility challenges. Everybody looks sad, lonely, aggravated, incompetent. Um, what we want is more of these positive images. And you can see right here just how different people look. They got a smile on their face. Not everybody's grumpy, um, even with chronic pain. And we know chronic pain is prevalent in older adults and it's difficult to live with chronic pain, but that doesn't mean we're not living. It shows people using technology. So I think we're, we're definitely on the path. And as I mentioned, with more of us getting older and us being a larger part of the, the population, boy, is it going to look different? So it's exciting. So let's dig into really talking about healthcare and aging. I'm going to turn this over to Amanda to really start to look at uh, what are the issues that we're seeing in healthcare? What do we need to be aware of? So Amanda, take it away. Thank you so much, April. Um, that was such a great introduction to um, aging in our society and some of the beliefs that we hold as a society about aging and the older adults. And just for the record, I am team Martha Stewart all the way. Um, I love that she is just living her life in the way that she feels is best for her. And I hope we continue to see that trend over the next few decades. Um, so uh, this topic, this idea or thought of ageism and healthcare, which is what we're really going to dive into now is um, so pressing and important because quite frankly, as April said, the US population is aging and we are nearing a huge demographic shift here in the United States and also globally where the older population is going to outnumber the young. And this is really the first time you know, in history that we have had this, um, this dynamic going on. 
And um, here in the U.S., we'll see the population of older adults in this nation continue to increase. And not only will we see this increase in the 65 plus population, but we are also going to uh, begin to see what, what's coined as extreme longevity, where we will see more and more people living to 85 plus and even 100 plus years old. And so um, those of us on the call that are healthcare professionals, we will experience this shift, this demographic shift in the work that we do daily. And so really understanding what ageism is and how it presents itself is so important. So we can really begin to understand the complexity, the implications, and so we can begin solving for those things. Unfortunately, uh, studies do show that there is a very high prevalence of ageism in healthcare, and this crosses professional borders, meaning it doesn't live mostly amongst just doctors or just nurses, but ageism is prevalent across all healthcare providers and disciplines. And we see ageism exist across all healthcare settings as well. So again, this is not something that is isolated mostly just in like an inpatient facility uh, setting, for example, but it occurs across the entire continuum of care. And there are many theories as to why ageism exists and is so prevalent in healthcare. Uh, as April shared, society often holds stereotypes about aging, portraying older adults as frail, dependent, sometimes mentally impaired even. And in healthcare, these stereotypes can lead to negative biases and assumptions that older individuals are less capable or even less deserving of receiving certain treatments or interventions. Healthcare providers, like any individuals, can hold implicit biases about the older adult that can affect their attitudes and decision making. And it's possible that these beliefs are mirroring the negative stigmas and stereotypes that are so prevalent in our society. Um, there's some theories that suggest that the fear of the healthcare professional's own mortality drives ageist behaviors, and I found this really fascinating. Um, but as healthcare professionals, uh, we really do see and serve some of the sickest and frailest members of our communities. And so harboring negative stereotypes can serve as sort of a defense mechanism to cope with the anxiety created by the thoughts of one's own mortality. So in essence, creating this, uh, these negative stereotypes creates a psychological buffer or a boundary, if you will, that helps the healthcare professional uh, to avoid confronting their own aging and their own mortality. But regardless of the reason of why this exists and why it's so prevalent in healthcare, um, we know that it does take a physical, mental, and financial toll, both on the individual and on the societal level. And we're going to discuss this more uh, in, in more detail moving forward. But first, I wanted to go back and just apply what we learned from, from April's opening about the different types of ageism and how they pertain to healthcare specifically, and just give you some examples and put it in this context. So starting with stereotypes, Ageist stereotypes are generalizations or oversimplified beliefs uh, about the older adult based on their age. Stereotypes can be positive or negative, but generally we see them on the negative side of things. Ageist stereotyping attributes certain characteristics, abilities, or limitations to people solely because of their age without really considering the wide range of individual differences within that age group. On the slide, you can see the example of older adults are cognitively impaired and cannot make decisions about their health. This is distinctively an overgeneralization of older adults. April gave us some examples of this, and when I think about this in my own life, I think about you know, my own parents who are in the you know, 65 plus, 75 plus aging space, actually, and um, using that example of you know, that technological competence or incompetence between you know, just my two parents, uh, there's this wide uh, variation on their comfort level of using technology. Both are active in technology, both have adopted using the smartphone, for example, that one is much more technologically savvy than the other. And um, you know, my dad has even taught my 10 year old son a few tricks on, on the phone that he thinks is pretty cool. So again, we just cannot um, 
clump uh, individuals together based on age because there are so many individual factors that contribute to this. <clears throat> and looking at uh, prejudices, um, ageist prejudice, prejudice refers to negative attitudes, beliefs, or feelings held towards individuals or groups based on their age. So if one truly believes all older adults are cognitively impaired and are unable to make their own health decisions, then they will begin to treat them differently than those groups you believe are not cognitively impaired. And this leads us into uh, discrimination. And this is unjustified and negative behavior towards the older adult. In healthcare, this may manifest as the healthcare professional being less patient and maybe less empathetic with the older adults because they, they have this thought process and this belief that they are all cognitively impaired. So you can see these three are very interrelated and they build upon and influence one another. Ageist stereotypes lead to ageist prejudices and thus discriminatory behavior. And so when we put all of this together, and think about it in the context of healthcare, and, and let's think about how does this present itself in healthcare. So uh, this slide provides numerous examples of how ageism, again, those stereotypes, prejudices, and discriminatory behavior can present in the healthcare setting. And with ageism being as prevalent as it is, it's very likely that those of us here on the call that are, that are in healthcare, that we have, an encounter, we have encountered a situation like this. I'm not going to read through all of the examples, but as you review the list, I'd love for you to take a minute and reflect on a moment in your career where you may have witnessed a similar situation. And as you think about that situation, there's a few questions I'd like you to ask yourself. Um, first of all, I'd like you to ask yourself, did you recognize it as ageism? Like, did you know that's what was happening? Um, what did you do in that moment? How did it make you feel to witness an interaction, this type of interaction? And most importantly, what do you think the impact was to the patient or the older adult in this situation? If you are, feel compelled to share and you can, you know, kind of briefly type it in the chat, um, I think we'd love to see those. Uh, I, I think once we start sharing all of our individual stories, we'll probably be surprised at how often uh, this happens, honestly, and maybe more so than we would even like to admit. But as you continue to reflect on this, uh, I want to begin talking about the implications of ageism in healthcare. Uh, while there are many, and this is a broad, complex topic, um, for today's purposes, we're going to condense them down into three main categories. And these three categories are the physical health, mental health, and finally, financial impacts. And we're gonna go ahead and take a closer look at each of these individually. So we saw earlier that ageism in healthcare for the older adult can lead to over-treatment and under-treatment adverse drug reactions due to polypharmacy and delayed or inadequate diagnoses. And so it's no wonder that uh, this can have a huge impact on the older adult's physical health. Studies have shown that the effects of ageism is associated with an earlier death. And um, I wanna stop, I kinda wanna just pause here for a moment and point out that it's not like just an earlier death. This is on average a 7.5 year um, decrease in life expectancy. And that is huge. And when you, when you think about that, that is a lot of quality of life for anyone, but especially the older adult that can be experienced in that 7.5 years. And this to me is a staggering statistic that really brings the enormity of this problem to light. And in addition to earlier death, we will also expect to see poorer health-related outcomes. And again, no surprise there, right? This is a result of things like over-treating the conditions of the older adult, or on the other end of this spectrum, completely dismissing the concerns, uh, writing it off as just part of old age, and then missing you know, the, an underlying aggressive disease process. And lastly, in terms of physical health, uh, this experience tends to lend to a decrease in wellness behaviors and an increase in risky behaviors such as alcohol and tobacco use. Because as you might imagine, this is a coping mechanism that, that an older adult might use when experiencing this type of discriminatory behavior. 
And so again, uh, these compound each other and build upon one another and leads us to that overall outcome of the earlier death and decreased life expectancy. Uh, the next category is mental health. And much like physical health, ageism also has a negative impact on mental health and well-being, which we know drives a lot of our wellness and prevention behaviors which again, feeds into our physical health, right? So I think you're seeing a pattern here, how all of these just compound on top of one another. Um, experiencing ageism can contribute to psychological distress among older adults. Negative attitudes, stereotypes, or discriminatory treatment can lead to feelings of frustration, sadness, anger, and low self-esteem. Ageist encounters can result in emotional strain and psychological burden, burden leading to experiences of increased stress. Ageism in its various settings, including healthcare, can increase the risk of depression and anxiety among older adults. Being devalued, such as when experiencing age-based discrimination, can lead to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, which are risk factors for mental health conditions. Ageism can contribute to social isolation and loneliness among older adults. Negative stereotypes may result in older individuals feeling disconnected from their families, their communities. They may experience a lack of social support and may even feel like they're being excluded from social activities. And if we learned anything from the global pandemic, it's that social isolation and loneliness have detrimental effects on mental health and overall well-being. And for this is for anyone of any age, but especially those that are um, already at risk for social isolation. Um, Self-stigma. Uh, this can lead to further social isolation and loneliness. Self-stigma influences help-seeking behavior among older adults. When individuals stigmatize themselves based on their age, and April touched on this too, they may feel reluctant or ashamed to seek health care services. This can result in delayed or inadequate access to necessary care. And this potentially exacerbates health issues, which again affects the overall well being of the individual. Ageist attitudes can undermine the sense of purpose and engagement in life among older adults. Feeling undervalued or disregarded based on age can lead to a diminished sense of meaning and reduced motivation to engage with society, impacting overall mental well being, which can lead to risk for self harm and even suicide. So again, uh, these are all interrelated compounding factors that begin to change the behavior of the older adult and how they engage with society and also how they engage with healthcare. And this is why it's important for us to understand this because uh, as healthcare professionals, we really own this in our everyday interactions. It would be really easy to brush off the older adult as not engaging and label them as non-compliant. And we've probably all done that, those uh, healthcare professionals on the call today. I'm sure we've seen, you know, um, we've had moments where we've said, well, this, this patient is just non-compliant and there's nothing we can do. Um, and then what, what we tend to do is put them into that stereotype, that bucket of older adults are cognitively impaired and cannot make decisions about their health. Going back to that example that we used pre previously, so once we begin to understand that this really long list of like physical and psychological stressors that may be the cause of the withdrawn and disengaged behavior, then we can begin to understand why the patient is disengaged and non-compliant. And then as healthcare professionals, we can begin to change our own behavior and how we interact with that individual to set them up for success and healthy aging, which is what we all want, right? In moving on to the third category, this is financial impacts. Um, so uh, ageism not only has a cost on the individual person, but it takes quite a toll on uh, society as well. And I have a few statistics on the slides here. Um, the first one, it's uh, there was one study that estimated that in the US alone, the cost of ageism and its implications is roughly 63 billion dollars annually. I mean, that is a huge number and it literally blows my mind when I think about um, every year, $63 billion um, that's basically, I guess I would say, wasted on, um, the, on this idea of ageism and its implications. 
And then there's another study with an even bigger number. And while this does not pertain to ageism um, specifically, it's, it's pertaining to the cost of overtreatment as waste in healthcare, which we know uh, can be driven by ageism. Um, this was $158 to $256 billion annually. Again, another huge, huge number. Um, and the significance here is that this is a huge financial impact on society, right? And countries with publicly funded healthcare systems, like Medicare, for example, we're all familiar with Medicare, ageism related disparities directly impacts healthcare costs. And when you put this in the context of value based care, where the goal is really managing the cost and the quality of the care, we cannot ignore the impact that this has on the economy, on the healthcare economy. And if we take this down really and get really granular with it and take this down to the individual level, um, you know, let's, let's think about the older adult here in this situation. Uh, how many of, of you, and you know, you can kind of raise your hand here if you're guilty of this, how many of you have delayed healthcare visits because of co-pays and out-of-pocket costs? I know I'm very guilty of this. Um, I'm, probably honestly guilty of doing this with my children, like, oh, we'll see, you know, like it'll resolve. I'm sure we don't need to go. We don't need to go to the doctor. Um, let's just give it a few more days, right? Because, you know, I know there's a cost, uh, both in terms of time and money associated with any healthcare visit that I have. Um, but when you think about this for our older adults that are on fixed incomes, uh, and, and then the older adult, but then let's think of that, um, we talked about the extreme longevity and this idea of people living to 100 plus years old. Um, when they retired at 65 and now they're 100 plus years old and they've been living on a fixed income for decades, when we think about um, over treatment as an implication of ageism, there is, a, there is a cost to the individual for each of these touch points um, that they have with healthcare, and that gets expensive over time. So really, all of this is to say that addressing ageism can help ensure equitable and efficient use of healthcare resources and can help lead to higher quality and lower cost for everyone, the individual and uh, Medicare society. And that's really ultimately the goal in our health healthcare system today, and especially the goal in our healthcare system when it comes to value-based care and managing that cost and quality. And so that was a lot, um, and this is a really big topic uh, with huge individual and societal impacts. So it can seem really overwhelming, and, but I hope you've asked yourself at least once during this presentation, yes, I get this, this is huge, but what can I do about it? And um, April touched on this, and I'm going to touch on this as well. I think the good news is that um, it does start with us, each of us, here on this uh, call today. And the, the other good news is that there are some really simple things that each and every one of us can do every day to begin helping to reduce the overall presence of ageism in our society, which is really huge when you think about that, that we collectively can have this um, an impact on this really big uh, societal problem that we're facing today. So yes, this process starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with each of us here today. And the first step is really this um, practice of self-reflection and understanding uh, what unconscious biases you may have towards older adults. And not only really understanding that, but really getting to the root of why those thoughts exist, because that is a key component. Um, it's Again, is it is it your own mortality that you're facing? Is it, you know, thoughts that have filled your head from societal images? Really, what is driving some of these, you know, negative stereotypes that you might have and uncover them? Because sometimes we have these and we don't even realize that. So that's this process of self-reflection. Um, you want to begin educating yourself on ageism and its effects and implications, which more great news. We're already doing that um, here today. So you've taken some really great steps already towards helping solve this problem. Um, and the next step is to create a self-action plan. What are the small steps that you will begin to take in your daily work that will change how you interact with the older adult? And maybe it's not in your daily work. Maybe it's in, in your daily life. Uh, maybe it's professionally or personally. What are some different things that you can think of that you could tweak or change in, in, in your approach that would, um, you know, kind of take those, those 
potentially ages or unconscious biases out of your actions. Um, if you guys have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. You can drop them in the chat. Um, the next step is to become an advocate. Again, you can do this in your daily practice. You don't have to do this formally, just how you interact every day. Um, you can do this easily to become an advocate. And, and other ways you can do this for those healthcare professionals or you know, other related disciplines on the call, um, you can become an advocate by ensuring that you are using person-centered care plans and care plans that really puts the individual's unique wants and needs at the forefront. Uh, you can also incorporate age-friendly practices into your care plans and into your interactions with the older adult. Uh, age-friendly, there's a lot of great resources out there. I'm not going to go into that because um, teaser, uh, April's going to cover more of that here in a few minutes. Um, but definitely easy, easy things that we can all do every day if we're mindful about ways to help alleviate ageism in our interactions with older adults. And finally, get involved. Uh, again, there are lots of ways to do this. And if a few ex examples and ideas, if your place of employment has an ethics committee, join it. Um, I was on the ethics committee for a hospital that I worked out worked at, and I promise you, um, it will be a very eye-opening experience. Uh, you'll be very surprised at the, the things that come up um, in that ethics committee, and it's just uh, will give you a new lens for how you look at situ different situations. Um, you may also consider including promoting healthy aging as part of your employer's DEI activities or programs. And if you feel compelled, you could take this to even a little bit higher level and get involved in local, state, or even national policy design that helps create a fair and equitable framework when caring for or working with the older adult. And we'll see a lot of policy design changes here over the next few decades. Um, you know, the baby boomers, uh, honestly, as that generation is called, has pushed societal and economic norms from the very beginning. And we're, I think we'll see that continue on um, here over the next few decades as well, especially what, uh, in terms of what does aging look like? Where do we age? Um, is that in the home? Is that a facility-based type of experience? And so this is actually a really great time, I think, to get involved in those policies that are going to be set over the next few decades. And so this is, uh, includes my portion of the presentation about um, ageism and healthcare specifically. I'm now going to turn it back over to April, and she is going to take us a little bit deeper into the advocacy and age-friendly practices of older adults. April, take it away. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm sitting over here, I just get, I get very fired up. <laughs> I hope you're fired up as well. The, and this is such a huge topic. And, you know, Amanda, when you said noncompliance, I wrote a note about that because it is such an issue. It, it really is. And it's complicated. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I have to give a shout out to healthcare. Amanda and I have both worked uh, in in healthcare uh, for many years. I've been across all the continuums of care. Um, and, you know, I think everyone does the 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 best we can, but it's getting more and more challenging, right? You look at just the staffing issues alone that we're dealing with. How are we going to help people to really understand who they're dealing with and do this well? So, um, you know, there's hope, but there's lots of work to do. Um, one of the things as a gerontologist that I think is very important, and maybe I have some biases, but I am always encouraging autonomy for older adults. And that means that they have the right to make decisions without being influenced or coerced. And I would assume a lot of people on this call probably deal with families um, of aging adults. And we know how complicated those family relationships can be. Um, so it's like, who's in charge? Um, my theory is, unless someone is deemed incompetent and cannot make decisions for themselves, they are allowed to make decisions for themselves. And sometimes we don't like it, right? But we have to, um, you, we have to promote autonomy because the flip side of autonomy is helplessness and dependency. And that's not good either. And I see some of this, you know, 
I, I have to admit that, you know, even with the topic of ageism, I, you know, I sit on the fence and I'm like, okay, is this ageism? Is this just, is this reality? You know, because sometimes with aging, there's a lot of, um, you know, there are some negative sides today of aging. We can't put our heads in the sand and say, oh, ageism is a fabulous, aging is fabulous, because there are some difficult sides of aging, um, disease, chronic disease, dementia, poor health. It doesn't mean everybody's going to have these things. Um, but we also have to admit that there are there are some declines with aging. Um, my background is gerontology. And then before that, it's wellness. So, you know, I'm just a firm believer in, in keeping aging adults, first of all, responsible for their own behaviors um, and making those decisions um, that will improve the quality of their life. Um, help them with their daily routines. Um, but essentially, we don't have a right, nor <laughs> can we, we get people to do what they're not willing to do. And I think that's a compliance issue, is many times we're forcing or healthcare is forcing or providers are forcing an agenda onto the older adult without really acknowledging what matters to them, right? And so that gets complicated. Um, but my goal is, first of all, I think people are going to do better when they make their own decisions. And some of these things uh, don't necessarily have to be, um, you know, bad. I, I, I facilitate a dementia support group, uh, and these are caregivers who are dealing with and caring for their dementia family members. And so many of the topics are about control, right? getting them to do something and not getting um, the outcomes that they want, right? Mom refuses to take a shower. Dad wears the same clothes every day. Um, and I think sometimes you have to ask yourself, how important is it? Is it important to you or is it important to them? And sometimes we have to, um, you know, choose our battles accordingly. But I do believe um, uh, encouraging autonomy is so important. There are some very exciting things uh, in the space of age-friendly care initiatives. I'm not an expert on this particular uh, age-friendly care uh, health system, but I'm fascinated and I think it, it appears to be an amazing solution. Uh, even if your organization is not an age-friendly uh, care or part of this, this movement, some of the stuff that they teach, we can all use and apply. Uh, and, and essentially, this started years ago, uh, the John Hartford Foundation, along with Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and also uh, Catholic Health Association, American Hospital Association. Basically, they set some goals to certify healthcare institutions as age-friendly in order to improve patient care efficiency and outcomes, right? I mean, healthcare is a business. We know that. Uh, there are dollars spent. There are dollars um, utilized. How can we best take care of our aging population? And I just love the process and, and how they frame this out in terms of the four M's, as they call it. And um, these four M's are what matters. What, what matters to you as a patient, as a client, as an aging person? Medication, mentation, and mobility. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think they are doing some really interesting things. And I have found this very useful myself uh, in trying to help uh, those that I care for and, and those that I uh, encounter try to set their own goals. So let's take a look a little bit deeper at these four M's. Um, and again, this is something everyone can use, whether or not you're, you know, it's formalized through an organization. And um, we actually did a presentation for at, at the ASA conference, Lakeland, uh, Hogan, Eichenberger and myself on this very topic. And we interviewed um, some of our clients and we talked to them about what matters most to you. You know, when, uh, uh, you know, Amanda was talking about the complexities of healthcare and all the different things going on and the noncompliance, you know, we don't always start with what matters to the person. They often have a very complicated care plan. 
I look at my uh, my uncle who passed away last year. He had uh, dementia, wasn't really diagnosed, but he had so many other health problems. And, um, you know, I would say the last six months of his life, um, he was put through the ringer um, with everything. And I would say the over um, over treating of him because they didn't know what to do. Um, let's go over here. And he was, you know, through the VA, getting his health care through the VA. So it was a little bit cumbersome for my aunt. She spent entire uh, days taking him from one appointment to the other. But and they weren't prioritizing what matters to him and how can we really have the best outcome and the best achievements for this person. Uh, so starting with what matters to them most, their goals, their preferences really can uh, be, is, is very impactful. Um, and I think you'd be surprised if you really ask that question. And if you get the buy-in from these, uh, these patients, obviously, if they're uh, choosing their goals and preferences, they're going to be a lot more likely to comply to adhere. We can't talk about age-friendly care without talking about medications. Massive problem. Um, and, you know, again, I think healthcare is still siloed. Um, I studied population health. I think Amanda did as well. I've been in this field a long time. I've always been very hopeful that we're going to get this right. Um, and then, you know, something like a pandemic happens and we go way back uh, in, in success and, and that now we're, we're trying to build up and we're not ready. I mean, I, I don't think anybody would deny that our healthcare system and our society is not ready for the aging population. So I think the best thing we can do is get our aging population ready, right? Have them have that autonomy, take responsibility, know what they want and do the best they can do to live their highest quality of life which is what matters most to them. With medications, we know, you know, how impactful this is and how, um, you know, high risk medications are in, impacting other aspects such as mobility and mentation. Um, so, and we need to make sure that we're reviewing high risk meds. We're desubscribing. Why are you on this medication? How long have you been on it? What, uh, what milligrams are you? Oh, you've been on this for 20 years. Now your body might be processing that differently. Do we need to adjust? And we need to ensure that meds don't interfere with these other four M's. So it's really just kind of putting this framework up to try to manage the complexity of the aging adult. The mentation is about monitoring mental and cognitive well-being. Uh, and this includes changes um, in things related to depression, um, cognition, um, and, uh, and all things around that and keeping themselves, um, you know, sharp and, and able to do the things that they want to do. Uh, and then, of course, there's mobility. And we talked about that before. And I saw uh, an interesting question in there about, you know, mo mobility as I was looking through the chat. Um, I can't find it now, but it's like, you know, obviously, we do have some mobility changes. Is is that ages to say that? Or is that is that reality? I think it's what we do with that information that's most important. But we want to ensure that older adults, um, move safely. We want to improve their function so that they can do what matters most to them. For example, to somebody that's getting out of the hospital, perhaps I want to get home so I can walk my dogs. We know that people love their animals. Can we use this as a motivator for, all right, then let's do, we're going to do some therapy, we're going to do this, are you willing, are you able, you know, to, how does that sound to you? We're going to get a lot better. I use this with my own aunt, who I'm a caregiver for, and I bought tickets to Willie Nelson, because she wants to go this summer. It's an outdoor venue in the middle of August, okay? I didn't tell her, no, nope, you're too old, no, nope, we can't do this. I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but if she wants to do it, I'm up. So I use that as the mo motivation because last year she really fell um, into a bad experience within healthcare. She started out with a UTI. 
Um, and um, this went on for several months and in and out of the hospital, in and out of rehab, all because of a UTI that created delirium. And on her last rehab stay, um, she was afraid to go home. And she was saying that because, quite frankly, she had so much delirium through those last six months, she didn't even know what was happening. Um, and at that point, um, they did not know what to do with her, so they sent her to a geriatric psych unit. And there she was choked by another resident. She was clearly not in the right space. So when I say this topic gets me fired up, it does get me fired up. And I think it's important that we look at all the experiences and how we can help the older adults navigate for themselves. I also saw somebody put in the chat that an older adult was uh, in a facility, a, um, a you know perhaps a rehab center, and the staff was using elder speak. And she said, don't speak to me like that. I'm not a child. And I'm like, yeah, we have to speak up, right? So I love these four M's. I think uh, they really provide a good framework as we're dealing with our own family or our clients or anyone uh, that we encounter in terms of helping them because, you know, we're empathetic. We're all in this field because we are empathetic and passionate about keeping older adults safe. But I think sometimes that empathy can create um, dependency if we're not careful, right? Because we don't want them to do these things. Uh, what's the worst thing ca that can happen? If somebody, you know, is, uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm still going to, well, I'll use my aunt as an example again, I'm still going to go online on that dating app and, and date these fellas, even though she's been um, exposed and been um, part of a scam right? She's still going to do it. Um, so how do we protect them with also giving them autonomy? How do we let them go out and take that walk when we're concerned they're going to fall again? Um, how do we, um, you know, manage the fact that mom is a diabetic, but yet she doesn't quite eat the way we think she should? Um, well, um, we have to let them make decisions, but to me, those decisions also come with consequences, and they have to understand that, well, if you're going to do that, then you're probably going to puff up, and you're going to swell, and you're going to have this problem or that problem. Are you okay with that? So again, if we keep taking it back to what matters most, I think we're going to have a little more success. And that's where we just really talk to that aging adult. And uh, again, we did a wonderful interview with some of our clients about what's important to them. And it was very heartwarming to really let them speak about their experiences and why they accept help. Because we know that many times we're all reluctant, right? Nobody wants to be dependent. So I think we have to, first of all, sometimes put ourselves in the shoes of aging adults, um, especially when you're a caregiver, because it's such a dance. We're exhausted sometimes trying to do everything we have to do in our life and also do everything uh, that they need. But many times we're doing it because we're afraid, oh, you can't do that. Let me do that for you. Uh, nope, I don't, I'm going to take care of that. You can't do that. Well, do we know that? Um, you know, and what's the worst thing that can happen? And I think sometimes we have to sort of weigh those consequences. It's not ideal all the time, but in reality, we cannot force people to do things. Um, and I think about the behavior change models and how when somebody, uh, we want somebody to quit smoking or start exercising, we have to think where are they in that decision to change? Because we can't put them in that right place. They have to be willing. And if we let them set the goals for themselves, all right, are you willing to, um, you know, increase your daily activity because you've been sitting, you know, most of the day watching TV and you, we know you're getting weaker. Um, are you willing to, you know, um, increase your activity so that you can do blah, 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 what matters to them? And it's a complicated process. I said this before. When you think about somebody who is leaving uh, a ho after a hospital stay, all the things that they have to do. Um, and so managing these things. And we know that it's common. I think the statistic is, what, at least 20% of people um, over the age of 60 are managing uh, multiple 
uh, chronic condition. So it can be complicated. Um, and clinical decision making, you know, for most older adults is really difficult. So it's easy to throw the hands up and say, oh, my gosh, I just left and they gave me this whole list. They want me to do this, this, this and this. Well, that's where we start to prioritize, right? What matters to you? What's most important? Um, and how do we keep them safe while also helping them prioritize all the things they have to do? We also know that older adults are often excluded from many clinical trials. And so um, sometimes, you know, some of the things um, related to coexisting conditions um, may not, um, we don't have the research for them. So we just have to be aware. <coughs> Excuse me for just a second. And, you know, I think also when I, again, think of my uncle at the end of his life, that they spent the last years of his of his life, uh, quite frankly, in doctor's visits. And that's not the best. And I'll close by talking briefly about the art of dying well, because we can't talk about healthcare and aging without acknowledging um, how critical this issue is. And I do believe um, everyone has the right to die well um, and not most people just aren't talking about it. So I just want to give a plug for talking about end of life uh, issues, talking about what's important. Uh, creating end-of-life wishes. 90% um, of older adults say uh, talking to their loved ones is important, but only 20% has had these conversations. So we need to include this. We need to um, make it a reality. And to me, it just sets up for um, a beautiful end to your life when you know what someone's wishes are. We've got lots of resources. We've talked about so many great things, and we have just a few minutes left for Q&A. And Amanda, I don't know about you, but I've been looking about this list, and um, gosh, how do we? There's so many good questions in here. Um, let me look. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of good comments. Yeah. Um, I love see. it um, for being chatty and, you know, providing thoughts and and all yeah. the good questions. I do see one that I would like to address if, Please. if that's okay, April. Yeah, um, go for it. Uh, I'll just kind of summarize it here, but it is, uh, I recently heard the term person-directed care, and I think I talked about person-centered care, and what is the difference in these terms? Um, I think that's a great question. I'll provide my two cents worth, and April, if you have anything, please feel free to um, Sure to, you know, fill in the blanks as well. But I, so I, I see person-centered care being kind of the umbrella, like an umbrella topic, and person-directed care is then part of that. Um, it's an extension maybe or lives under person-centered care. So April, you really talked about what matters most, right? Like what is important to the individual and incorporating that into um, our plans of care and then pay and then, and then Taking that further person-directed care is now really the autonomy of that person and um, giving them the tools and the ability to really uh, control their care. Um, we can come up with a care plan, you know, that we think is great, but we do know, and April, you mentioned this, you know, medicine, historically, healthcare has been kind of a one-size-fits-all and isn't really centered around that person. So um, I hope I explained that well, but I, I, they're very interrelated. But to me, person-directed care is just taking that person-centered care a step further and really giving the individual a lot of autonomy around um, their care plan and um, medical decisions. Yeah. Anything you'd and like I to want add? to say that... You no, but I, I, I'll just kind of say that there's a lot of great comments and questions in here, and I know that uh, uh, Amanda and I are both willing to take those uh, via email if you send them, if we don't get to address your question. So thank you for submitting so many thoughtful things in the this section. Uh, I, well, I'm looking at number 18 as far as, but many older adults are cognitively impaired or maybe in the future. How do we deal with these situations? And I think that's just a huge challenge. Um, I'll say again, when I was with my aunt in the hospital, um, you know, the doctor came in, I happened to be there after a particular surgery that she had had, and this was her second hospitalization. She was clearly delirious. 
I mean, clearly delirious. And I was surprised when this young, and I'll call him a whippersnapper, maybe that's ageism, I should be careful. Uh, he came in and started talking to aunt, my aunt, and I was glad he was talking to her, not me. But he, he was clueless that she could not comprehend. And he was going into so much detail and it was very frustrating. So um, I think it's challenged because how do they have the opportunity to really know what is going on with this patient? I recognize we're out of time, so I want to be respectful and turn this over. Um, we're happy to take these questions. Our emails are available. Please stay in touch and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, April and Amanda. That was a really great and informative uh, presentation. As I can tell from all of the wonderful comments uh, that came in through the chat and all of the questions. Um, so we are glad that you found this webinar useful. It was a pleasure having you, April and Amanda, here today. Uh, please be sure to check out any upcoming webinars at www.asaging.org. You can also catch part one of um, Addressing Ageism in the previously recorded webinar section for Home Instead. Um, thank you again, everyone. If you have any questions, please send us an email at info at asaging.org. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.